Hey, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Keep Calm. It's just a snake podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Jay-Z. Joining me, we have uh, a rarity, a local here in Colorado. He's a zookeeper at the Denver Zoo, works in Tropical Discovery. Troy, how you doing? I'm doing good, doing good. How are you doing, man? Crazy, crazy holidays. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, um, probably you get asked this uh, more often than not, and you probably have the same answer as uh, literally no one ever. How'd you uh, get interested in reptiles? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, I've been very interested in reptiles from a very young age. You know, I was always that kid uh, off in a ditch somewhere, um, you know, catching snakes, catching lizards. Um, I think it all sparked from my, uh, I had an uncle or have an uncle um, that has always had reptiles, you know, ever since I was a kid. And and uh, he does a bunch of outreach programs. So I've always been over at his house playing with his reptiles. Um, but uh, yeah, just been messing with them from a very young age and, and have always loved them. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. When did you, when did you think that you wanted to do a uh, zookeeper? Cause that's a path that a lot think of, but not necessarily all follow. Yeah, sure. I've actually wanted to be a zookeeper for as long as I can remember. Um I uh, I can't remember when I officially first started, but I started doing these summer camps um, at the zoo when I was very young. Um, and uh, my mom even lied about my age on the form one year so I could do it an extra year. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I did that till I was about 13 years old. Um, and then I started as a, a teen volunteer at Denver Zoo. So um yeah I've I've always wanted I even have a a picture that I drew when I was in second grade saying what do you want to be when you grow up and it's me holding hands with a gorilla saying I want to be a zookeeper Uh, that's awesome yeah because I actually I used to want to be a a great ape keeper working with with gorillas and orangutans um but then I volunteered with primates for about four years and uh that dramatically changed my mind i was like i do not want to work with primates ever again <laughs> interesting yeah that's that's hilarious i've always yeah. been i was i was gonna ask like did you always you know you've had the you've had the passion for reptiles obviously but yeah. did you always want to do the herps or was it something else or yeah i want i wanted to work with primates i wanted to work with gorillas specifically um and then, you know, I just, I just did not enjoy it. It was, it was quite interesting. It's pretty much working with very intelligent toddlers that oh, you have to change how you work with them almost on a daily basis, uh, just because they are so intelligent and, you know, they, you might say, Hey, let's, let's shift into the outdoor yard and I'll give you this, you know, frozen smoothie. And they're like, I don't really feel like frozen smoothies today. How about some popcorn? You know, and you're like, just get outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So it just oh, it got frustrating. It got annoying. It got monotonous. And I was like, oh, yeah. No, that's so. no fun. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, so how long have you been working uh, in Tropical Discovery then? For this? Yeah. So everybody. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, coming up on six years. Uh, it oh, will wow. be six years in April that I've been in Tropical Discovery. Um, and I'm loving every second of it. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Did you um, have to like go through any like processes or steps to number one, get hired into the zoo and then to get to the individual places you wanted to be at or? Um, yeah, it kind of, I'll kind of explain um, how I went about it. Um, kind of the requirements needed for zookeeping and specifically a Denver zoo. Um but, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I've been working my whole life towards this. And so I kind of had the, uh, the upper hand, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. But in order to be a full-time zookeeper at Denver Zoo, uh, you need to have um, either two years of paid experience at an AZA accredited uh, facility. Um, that is a, a facility that's accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, right. So two years paid experience plus a four-year degree um, in an animal-related field. Uh, or you need four years paid experience and a two-year degree um, in a related field. So um, I uh, bounced around at a bunch of colleges and then ended up attending Pikes Peak Community College down in Colorado Springs. 
Um, okay. They have a very renowned zookeeping program. Um, hmm. that's for zookeepers taught by zookeepers, um, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then while attending school down there, I, uh, or attending college, um, I got an internship in tropical discovery, um, through a connection that, you know, the, the guy I knew worked there and we've always been buddies and I ran into him at the zoo and, uh, he was like, Hey, you should come intern for us. And I'm like, Oh, game on. Um, uh, awesome. so just right place at the right time. And then from there, you know, I graduated, uh, I was interning the whole time um and applied uh when they when they have it had an opening and was just you know fortunate enough to get it um but uh before that uh you know before the internship in tropical discovery uh i did seven years of that that teen volunteer work um and i also had uh three under other internships uh at denver zoo before that so i had a lot of experience um and time spent at denver zoo uh which really helped uh you know, me, me getting that job because otherwise zookeeping is a incredibly competitive field. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to get a job as a zookeeper um, just out of the competitive nature of it. Um, I mean, my building alone or tropical discovery alone, there's only nine zookeepers um, and, you know, they can only hire a position when someone leaves and most oh, zookeepers geez. love what they do. And so they, right. they are zookeepers till, you know, till the day I, day they die pretty much. Uh, oh, wow. And so I've got some coworkers that have been working at Denver Zoo for over 20 years. Um, so, you know, and, and when there is a job opening, you know, there's one opening to fill and we get like 40 applicants for that one position. So it's incredibly yeah. competitive and I was very lucky and very fortunate to be where I was when they had an opening um because i pretty much had a working interview for my job which which really helped out uh being that's an awesome. intern there so cool so yeah that's that's something that i've always heard but i've never actually like had the chance to sit down and talk to somebody because it always seems like it's a like like you said it's so competitive that it's just like it's just hours and hours and a lot of time and a lot of love and commitment to it and then kind of what you said right place right time yeah. who you know yeah. So, well, that's really cool. Um, so kind of what of like, I mean, I'm aware that, you know, a lot of the people who have animals at home kind of are aware of the usual stuff that has to go on like a day to day basis, but kind of what's like, you know, what's a Wednesday for Troy at tropical discovery? Like, so how does your day go about? Like, it's yeah, just, sure. It'd be really cool. Just like to hear like a day of a zookeeper. What's yeah. What's a day yeah, for so, you? Uh, um, so I'm, I'm a section keeper in tropical discovery. Okay. And what that means is the building is split up into five different sections, uh, three reptile sections and two fish sections. Um, and so I am pretty much assigned one fifth of the building. Um, and that is a reptile section. Um, I'm kind of known as the lizard guy in the building. Um, I, I love my lizards. So most of my section is lizards. Um, however, my section is called the bat section. So if you've ever been to Tropical Discovery, you might be familiar uh, that we ha do have bats in the building, um, right. three different species. We've got vampire bats, Jamaican fruit bats, and uh, Ciba short-tailed bats. And so when I get to work right after I clock in, the first thing I do every day is clean the bat cave. Um, That's awesome. That's yeah, hilarious. So it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny. Um, right now, we've got probably close to 1,000 bats in total. Oh, wow. um, majority of them being the fruit bats. And so I jump in there um, and I, I hose down the cave, get pooped on, peed on, um, you know, wonderful way to start the day. Uh, yeah, that's, that's you know. still, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, I love it. I tell people you haven't lived until you've had a baby bat wrap around your finger and start sucking on it. Um, it's pretty awesome. freaking adorable. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I clean the bat caves, clean both the bat caves. Um, and then I prep diets for the fruit bats. Um Bats have very fast metabolism, so they have to eat every day. Um, they have to eat a lot every day. So prep the diets for them, and then I feed them. Um, and then from there, it's pretty much just me going around, checking on every animal in my section. Um, you know, for me, which, which includes Komodo dragons, um, some smaller species of lizards like leaf-tailed geckos, uh, Mexican alligator lizards, um, I've got some blue tongue skinks and, and some knob tailed geckos in my section. 
Um, I've got uh, several species of venomous snakes, uh, mainly rattlesnakes, some southwestern speckled rattlesnakes, um, some ridge nose rattlesnakes, uh, cool. some barons racers. Um, uh, I've also got a Fiji iguana that I care for, rhinoceros iguana. Um, and so, yeah, just checking on a bunch of them. I do have some turtles in my section, some pretty critically endangered turtles in my section that I care for. Uh, so, yeah, checking on everything. I make sure everyone's alive and, and you know, water bowls are full, uh, lighting's working, basking lights are on, uh, misting systems are functioning. Um, and then after that, I'm washing windows because uh, we've got a lot of windows in the building. So I'm getting all the fingerprints off the windows from the previous day. Um, and then I'm getting started on my day. And, and depending on the day, uh, kind of determines what I do. Um, so, you know, it might be, you know, on Wednesday, it's salad day. Um, so I'm prepping salads for all the herbivorous reptiles in the building, um, which, which takes about an hour and a half, two hours out of my day uh, to right. do all that. Um, and then, uh, you know, some reptiles might need meds for the day. Um, I've got an Argus monitor that's on uh, some some pain medicine because he's has some skeletal issues. Uh, so I've got to give that to him on a daily basis. Um, and then, uh, you know, I might be feeding, maintaining my venomous snakes or the other snakes in my section uh, and cleaning exhibits, cleaning inside glass, um, you know, redoing exhi exhibits, doing water changes on some of the aquatic species I care for. Uh, but that's what I love about my job is, is there's definitely some routine to it, like the bat cave and, and salads, mm -hmm. but, um, every day can be a different day. You know, if, if that's I awesome. need to work on a project and redo an exhibit, um, or, you know, work on trying to breed a species, um, you know, that's, that's what is most enjoyable for me is, is, you know, having something different to do almost every day. That's awesome. So yeah. when when you said uh, redo an exhibit, so do you do that kind of for several different reasons? For, like number one for you know enrichment to change it up to give them something new to mess with, or you know just adding in like so what what all does that entail exactly? So sure, sure. So um, I redo my exhibits uh, entirely. I completely break them down probably once a year um, or every other year, just because. 90% of our exhibits in the building are bioactive setups um, mm -hmm. with, with misting systems and everything. So it's, it's a lot to completely break them down um, for anyone that's owned a vivarium or bioactive setup. You probably right. know that it's a lot of work. So um, sometimes they just deteriorate over time uh, and just need to be refreshed, revamped. And so I'll break them down completely to do that. Um, or I'll find out that the, you know, the exhibit's just not working. The plants are not doing well. And so I'll break it down for that. But then, yeah, I'll also uh, revamp it for the animal's, you know, mental welfare state um, just to redo it, to kind of engage them, enrich them um, and do something different for them. Uh, but it also might be that I'm putting a new animal on, on display or on exhibit. Um, and so I need to break the exhibit down for that reason um, to put, put that new animal and set it up to make it appropriate for that new species. Cool. So um, I'm going to circle back to some of these later down the road, but as stuff yeah. pops up, I'm just going to keep on addressing it. For sure. So when you talk about, you know, a new animal going up on exhibit, there's a large number of animals that the public will never see, correct? Correct. Correct. About, I would say probably 60 to 70% of the species that we have in the building are not on display. Yep. That makes sense. Um, and so is there like a rhyme or reason to which animals are on display? Like, is it, you know, animals that are doing really well here, you, you just tell me, sorry, before I start. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, I'd like to say there's a rhyme or reason to it, but it's mainly based on what us keepers like and think is cool. Um, okay. and what we have good exhibits for, uh, okay. you know, like right now we just acquired these, uh, um, Nerfurus wheeler isinctus, the, the knob tailed geckos, um, yeah. just got them in, you know, probably a couple weeks ago now. And, uh, right now I don't have an exhibit for him, but I'm going to be most likely breaking down the Lichianus exhibit, um, the oh. New Caledonia giant gecko, uh, mm -hmm. and setting it up for them. So just because the, the Nerfurus or knob tailed geckos, I think are going to display a little bit better than the Lichianus. 
Um, yeah, like, and I think people might get a little bit, little bit bitter kick out of them just because they're cool, unique little gecko. Um, yeah, and I think they're cool. Uh, so we're probably going to set them up and put them on display for that purpose. Um, but then like another example, uh, earlier this year, I got in a Fiji iguana uh, in mm-hmm. my section, which you know, Fiji iguanas are one of the creme de la creme of reptiles. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they've got an amazing story about about how they were smuggled into this country illegally uh, and yeah. their conservation status and all that. So, um, you know, I love Fiji iguanas. Not only did I want to get them on exhibit for just my love for them, but also because of their conservation status and the story behind them. Um, so we had to play some musical chairs and move some animals around just to specifically get that animal on display. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's multiple different reasons. You know, we, we like to keep some animals on display that people expect to see when they come to the zoo, uh, like a cobra, an anaconda, a gaboon viper, uh, a frilled lizard, um, Komodo dragons, of course, you know, cause, cause yeah, when people come to the zoo, they expect to see a lion, they expect to see a giraffe, same thing for reptiles, you know, uh, they expect to see the stuff that they saw in National Geographic. Um, so we try to keep those animals on display as well. Makes sense. So do you do, um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to phrase this. Uh, so for kind of their like, you know, regular enrichment, is it kind of the very similar to how we keep our animals kind of like at home? So, you know, stirring up the substrate fairly often, moving things around fairly often, not necessarily breaking it down, but just kind of like moving it around both on display and not just so that way it's, you know, not only something for them, but something for the public to see them interact with. Yeah. Something like that. Um, I mean, we definitely uh, have the ability to manipulate and and enrich the animals that are off display more frequently. Um, Mm -hmm. Because the biggest challenge with, displaying animals in a zoo setting is uh, I have to encourage those animals as much as possible to be visible Uh, because when a member of the public walks by an exhibit and don't see the animal that makes for a bad experience you know and so uh, that's I love exhibit design it's one of the biggest passions of my job is is the designing the exhibits aspect Um, but it's quite challenging when you get these you know, reclusive species that all they want to do is hide. And what can I do to encourage that animal to be on display? Um, And so with those, like, I'm actually doing a study right now on some orange-throated skinks uh, that we can get into, you know, a little later. But uh, environmental enrichment is kind of the biggest thing for our displays, um, Mm -hmm. our exhibits. And, And what can I do to enrich this animal in a natural way through its environment to stimulate activity that way it's not constantly hiding um, and encourage that animal to be out basking or thermoregulating and moving throughout its environment uh, to, you know, make for a visible animal and more engaging exhibit um, for the public's sake. So um, I try to design my exhibits as natural as possible to encourage every individual animal's uh, natural behaviors that you would see in the right. wild to encourage activity. Um, but then, yeah, for sure. I'm definitely doing daily or weekly maintenance on that exhibit to make sure that exhibit looks good, but also, you know, making sure those animals stay mentally stimulated or, or active. So. That makes sense. Yeah. I was going to ask like, you know, most reptiles are fairly cryptid by design. So, you know, it's, and that, and I'm sure you hear that a lot because we, I know I hear it just by cruising through, you know, just wait, you know, it's not there. It's where, where is it? It's, it's there. You just, you can't see it because it's doing what yeah. it's behaving naturally. So yeah. that must be probably an even bigger challenge for, you know, us reptile guys versus someone who has a giraffe or not, where if it's out yeah. in a yard, they're going to see it. So that's, yeah. Okay, sure. cool. That's really interesting. So, yeah, cause, um, you know, most people, most people think, oh, I've, I've got a pet snake at home. I can put a hide and, and, you know, my ball Python is probably underneath its hide 90% of the day and 10%, I might see it moving active. Well, if I put a ball Python on display at the zoo, uh, I need that animal to be visible 90% of the day without stressing that animal out. Um, yes. And that's, that's the biggest challenge, you know? So, uh, for example, you know, I've got some, uh, I've got an exhibit 
that houses uh, Euromastix yemenensis, um, so Euromastix species, uh, mm-hmm. some Xenogama tailori, which are shield-tailed agamas, um, Egyptian tortoise, and orange-throated skink. And, you know, Xenogama and, and Euromastix can be pretty reclusive species um, if they're yeah. not out basking. And so I've designed the exhibit to have these rock crevices that even when the animal is hiding and secure, you can still see the animal. You can still see how the Euromastix is using his tail to cover that rock crevice. Um, and sometimes just something as simple as that for the public is, is a positive experience, you know, cause they can still walk by and say, Oh, there it is. You know? Right. So they might not see the whole animal out, but they see the tail. So it still works out and that animal feels secure and is displaying a natural behavior, but it's still visible, which is awesome, which is my goal. So <laughs> that I'm hopefully I can have this kind of, you know, flowing along. Um, yeah. So that kind of leads me to my next thing. So, I mean, zoos still kind of have this in a larger than we'd like part of the population, this bad reputation of like, you know, keeping everything in these close cages. But as you just explained, it's a continuous thing that not only you love to do, but want to do and need to do of enriching these animals lives. Is that something that still comes up fairly often for you guys? That oh, man. You, no. No, yeah, no, you're totally right. It it comes up on it on almost a daily basis. Um, And I'll I'll be honest, there's some bad zoos out there. There are some there are some bad zoos, Um, bad zoos, bad aquariums. But every zoo or aquarium that is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums has to have a nutritionist nutritionist on staff has to have a animal welfare director on staff and has to have uh, an employed veterinarian. Um, and so every, every zoo that is created by the association of zoos and aquariums is constantly working towards the animal's physical and mental health. Um, right. we also have a director of animal enrichment, which, uh, or animal behavior, excuse me, which is, you know, in tied with enrichment. Um, right. and so we have to enrich our animals and assess welfare on a almost bi-monthly you know frequency otherwise we get shut down or we get fined and so a lot of people think that oh i'm just i'm just caring for animals i'm just you know picking up poop i'm just feeding them but it, it there's a lot more to it i have to maintain good welfare for my animals a good mental health for my animals uh in order to keep this zoo going and so you know, not only are we we caring for animals, but we're trying to do the best that we can by these animals, um, both both physically and mentally. Right. So, you know, it 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 breaks my heart when people you know reach out to me and say, "Hey, how can you work at the zoo? You know, it's a horrible place, and they're just they're just keeping these animals in the enclosures for for personal gain." And I'm like, you know, you with that- without zoos, you know little little uh you know jason over here wouldn't be able to come and see a tiger and then feel inspired to go out and do tiger conservation and save that species in the wild you know right exactly Um, yeah exactly so i i don't know i i love what i do i fully support zoos and and every you know everything that they do because i know that that we're we're doing what we can to do the best for for wildlife exactly yeah and that's that that is something that I I'm trying to do to to try to like branch out a little bit more because that's how it always starts. It's always that you know seeing that animal at the zoo, the the weirdo who comes to your school with the big yellow snake mm-hmm. that starts that spark that yeah. gets people active in conservation and wildlife management, in land management and biology or whatever it is. It's always that you know that spark, and we need that because mm-hmm. we've as a, as a species, we've done a lot uh, to be a real detriment to everything else. And so yeah. Yeah. zoos are, you know, one of the best ways that we can do it. I mean, how many success stories do we have now because of, you know, essentially repairing the damage that we did? Mm-hmm. Like, um, what is it, the, the Arabian, uh, Oryx yep. was extinct in the wild and, yep. um, 
you know that now how i mean what's the population now a couple a couple thousand is it at this I, point? I believe so yeah i believe so they yeah. were completely brought back t- into you know into the wild from zoos them and the uh the american bison uh would yeah. not exist today without without zoos or aquariums um I mean, yeah, the amount of, of conservation that these facilities do is incredible that, that, and zoos usually don't like to, you know, toot their own horn or go to combat with people that are against them. And, but if, if people just, you know, were, were open to listening and, and learning about what zoos actually do, I'm sure it would change yeah. everybody's mind. Exactly. So, I mean, and, and, so when before when you brought up maybe trying to breed a different species are you specifically trying to reproduce animals on species survival plans or that's that's the number one goal um because that's another thing that that you know talking about zoos and whatnot Um, right in order for me to breed an animal or to hatch an animal whether it's whether it's ss ssp or or not and and for those people listening that don't know what an SSP is, um, it's mm-hmm. a species survival plan. Um, and what that means is that zoos and aquariums uh, created by the association of zoos and aquariums um, that are involved in these specific SSPs or species survival plans are trying to maintain a healthy uh, population under human care. That way we could potentially release animals into, into the wild if need be. It's more of an insurance policy. Um, right. and so like lions are part of an SSP, uh, and there is one keeper that is called a stud book keeper. And it is that person's job to know every single individual lions or whatever animal it may be, uh, genetic background, um, or, or, you know, uh, genetics and then make breeding recommendations based on those genetics, um, in order, in order to maintain healthy bloodlines that way, if we did release them into the wild, if needed, um, we'd be setting them up for success. So, uh, so like in our world, in the reptile world, uh, mossy leaf-tailed geckos or Europlata sicori are an SSP. Uh, and so I have currently uh, five mossy leaf-tailed geckos, but I only have one breeding recommendation. So I only have two animals that I am allowed to breed based on their, uh, you know, genetic history. Um, but then... So with SSPs, it's kind of different because they just want us to breed them kind of as much as possible so we can build these insurance policies. But in order for me to breed it, I have to have, or to hatch it, I have to have somewhere for that animal to go. Um, So, you know, thinking in a bigger world, elephants or lions, you don't see every zoo having a baby elephant or a baby lion every year. Because if I have a baby elephant, I have to think about, okay, where can I put this baby elephant? I have to send it to another AZA accredited zoo that has space for that elephant. Same thing goes for reptiles. I have to have space for that animal for me to be able to raise it at Tropical Discovery, or I have to have a zoo or an aquarium lined up for me to send that animal to. Um, So, which which is kind of a, a... kind of a hard part of my job um, Mm. because that might mean not hatching out every single egg that I received from a clutch because only one zoo wants two animals you know Um, so like for for Komodo dragons you know they have an average clutch size of 25 30 eggs but Komodo dragons are a big lizard and so we can't send 30 Komodo dragons nationwide because there's not available space and so this past clutch that we had we only hatched out uh two dragons because that's all that we had available all that zoos out there had available space for so it's pretty pretty interesting stuff right and then so for the animals that don't have ssp uh ssp or is that something that you can kind of take a more active constant role in breeding to try to yeah, we definitely can. Um, those are, you know, again, kind of bred based on the keeper's interest. Um, mm-hmm. But also, you know, we have to have somewhere to go. So all zoos and aquariums accredited by AZA have this emailing service called the listservs. 
And that's how we most easily communicate with each other. Um, and not only for available animals, but for anything, you know, if I just acquired, you know, a reptile that I don't really know how to care for, but there might be a keeper out there that has better experience with it. I can post on these listserv and say, Hey, does anybody know how to care for this animal? And then whoever wants to reach out to me can, um, but that's how we'll, we'll, I don't like to use the word surplus, but surplus, uh, animals to other AZA facilities is, you know, if I'm breeding my, my, my phylodryas, my Barons racers, um, mm-hmm. I can say, Hey, I just received six eggs from my father dries bear and I, um, are any zoos interested? And then I'll set them up, put them in the incubator. Um, and then I'll have zoos reach out to me and say, I'll take three, I'll take two, I'll take five. And then I hatch that amount and send them off to those facilities. But if nobody reaches out to me, then, you know, we do not incubate those eggs. So, but it's still, you know, we, we still, will breed them even if people don't want the eggs because there's a lot of discussion and and stuff out there about uh reproductive health for animals and what it does for them uh Mm -hmm. mentally and systematically um and so i think it's a benefit to have these animals go through a natural cycle and and actually be able to breed in a captive setting Um, okay because i was i was just going to ask like that almost seems almost counterintuitive of that if we're trying to you know get as many as we can why can we only do you know two out of 30 or something like that but it's yeah as you said it seems all like red tape is kind of i don't like that term but it almost seems like there's a lot of red tape to it but there's a reason for it yeah sustainably and you know for the long-term big picture Mm -hmm. so okay i just i just wanted to kind of clarify that a little bit for anybody who goes wait that that doesn't make any sense yeah Um, i mean the other thing too is like think about it you know in a komodo dragon sense who who are an ssp um if i even if we taking available space out of the equation um if i hatched out all 30 of those komodo dragons i then flooded the genetic pool if you will with the genetics from the two animals that i bred um, and so sometimes keeping uh, populations n- low of specific genetics allow for more di- genetic diversity within the whole collection of zoos and aquariums, um, if that also yeah, makes sense. So. so that way, if something, you know, like almost like an arc type of scenario were to happen, we could have the widest possible range of genetics to release to then let nature essentially take its course. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. That's awesome. So since we're going on that, like, so what, I mean, what are some of the, have you, have you produced a large number of species in, in your time there? Um, a decent amount. Yeah. I've been able to breed and hatch, uh, you know, quite a few different species. Um, I have lost track of how many baby tentacled snakes I've produced uh, <laughs> during my time. Um, right now I have a total of, I think, 26 tentacled snakes, um, with a pregnant female. So a lot of different tentacled snakes. Um, I have helped hatch, uh, two different, two, two or, yeah, two different clutches of Komodo dragons now, um, which has been a pleasure to be able to work with, with hatchling Komodo dragons. Um, countless numbers of Europlatus, um, just cause they are a species, uh, of, uh, right. SSP, um i'm working on uh i've been real real close contact with um um with phil from arids only uh about breeding some euromastics um haven't haven't been able to go get them to go yet but hopefully this year that's Um, awesome yeah uh trying to think we've done some tree monitors um gosh i've kind of lost track now i mean it's it's been a while uh some cobras uh um plica plicas bunch of frogs yeah but a bunch of different species you know it's been it's been super fun that's really cool i mean i mean just like the tentacle snakes it's just really cool to me yeah. i've always liked those yeah. like I think, they're, they're I super fun i can't remember the year when the zoo first got them but i saw those the first time and it just blew my mind and so i'm always mm-hmm. just like super gung-ho to go take a look to see how many tentacle snakes are always on display that's so cool yeah in their in their current exhibit there are 10 
And oh, if, wow. if, if there's any Denver locals listening out there, if you can find all 10 on display, I will give you a dollar. Because um, <laughs> awesome. I usually have to go in from the top and start pulling snakes out to find all 10. Um, it is quite that's a challenge. Cool. Uh, that's cool. But yeah. Oh, that's now, they're, awesome. Man. They're super weird snakes. Super fun to work with. That's hilarious. Oh, man. That's sorry. I just got, I really like the tentacle snakes. And so that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Um, no worries. So um, just trying to think what what kind of like so when you're working with like the the baby komodo dragons because i honestly have to talk about the komodo dragons oh sure uh, because they're you know they're a varanid species obviously is a lot of the same thing that we a lot of the techniques and and mentality of working with other varanids with you know be it the arguses or the or the water monitors very similar to the dragons or y- yes and no um so we raise our raise raise our Komodo dragons in a very specific and interesting way. Um, mm-hmm. One, we we hand raise all of our dragons right out of the egg to try to habituate them or desensitize them to right. human contact, right? Because then, when they're a ten foot, one hundred and fifty pound lizard, uh, it makes something as as simple as nail trims a lot easier. Um, yeah. And so I'm in there playing with the Komodo dragons, you know four or five days a week uh just to just to try to work with them and habituate them um but we never involve food uh during those habituations um because we never want to have that association with us keepers and food um because that is how 90 percent of the serious bites have happened uh at zoos and aquariums is is during either training uh uh, trainings or, or something where there's been association of food. So um, mm. all of our interactions are positive interactions uh, and choice-based interactions uh, with the animal where, for example, when they were, when they were hatchlings, I would just go sit in there, um, not do anything, just sit in the enclosure, not do anything. And then what, what's amazing about Komodos is the, their curiosity gets the best of them. <laughs> and they eventually will come over to me to see what I am to, in, to inspect what I am, you know? So that makes it a little easier with Komodos because I'll tell you right now, they're hands down the most smart, most intelligent monitor lizard out there. Um, oh, that's awesome. They are on a completely different scale than every monitor species I have worked with. Um, for example, I've worked with hatchling uh, Nile monitors and Niles are, are dirt bags when they're hatchlings. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> they, you, you, you'll put your hand in the enclosure and they will posture up. They will huff and puff. They will tail whip you for, for as long as it takes. You could sit there with your hand in the enclosure for three days and the monitor lizard is still sitting there tail whipping you, puffing you, you know, whatever. With the Komodo dragon, you put your hand in the enclosure. They do the same thing. But then after about 15, 20 minutes, that Komodo dragon's coming over and licking you and climbing on you because they're like, okay, I got to see what you are. I got to right. inspect you. I got to figure it out. Um, and, and that's what's just amazing about them is they're so naturally curious that it makes these socializations a little bit easier because eventually they're coming over to you, you know? So um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just so much fun. But now, so I, I, currently have three of the six komodo dragons at denver zoo under my care they're in my section um and so i have the three three three-year-olds which if you've seen my my instagram you're probably very familiar with who they are uh, because i talk about them a lot um but uh i've been caring for them you know almost their entire life and they are just awesome now um i can i can pick them up i can mess with them um you know denver zoo just posted a video of me doing a nail trim with them uh they are they're pretty dang habituated to me um which has been you know just a blast because you know when you have that one animal that is just so docile that you can just take out and put on your shoulder it's like your best friend you know and you want to play with that animal as much as possible um those are those are my komodo dragons to me you know which they're not they're not pets. You know, I have to emphasize that these are not my pets. Um, yes. These are animals that I am fortunate enough to work with 
um, but they definitely hold a special place in my heart. Um, they are, they have just been such a joy to work with because of, you know, how intelligent they are and, and how fun they are. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, it's, it, at some point, I really need to come over there and just check those guys Dude, out. heck yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, come on by. You know, I'll let um, you meet them. They're pretty fun. Yeah, I'm, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure something out really here soon before <laughs> yeah. uh, before I go back to work full time too. Yeah. Um, so that being said, your Fiji Island iguana is it just do you just have the one that is in now or right now? Um, okay. Yeah, they're they're because they're such a prestigious animal. Um, they're mm-hmm. pretty difficult to acquire uh, to get into the SSP to get start to to you know start your involvement with the ssp um and so we acquired this male this this sub-adult male from miami um and we have plans to acquire one or two females in the near future uh to then breed them with but right now we just have the one male um but uh, i've been kind of doing the same thing with him and and socializing him uh but i've been using food uh just because a bite from a Fiji is not as bite, not as bad as a bite from a, uh, from a Komodo dragon, dragon you know? Right. Um, but, uh, but he's, he's pretty fun. I've got him to the point now where he'll crawl out under my hand and eat some mealworms. Um, That's awesome. but they're, they're super cool lizard, gorgeous lizard. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's fun to be able to work with a Fiji iguana. Cool. Uh, so, um, I want to ask about the rhino in a second, but, uh, yeah, because- yeah. I imagine he's a little a little bit more Hannibal than mine because mine's still <laughs> we're still working through her uh, her terrible twos. But, nice. Um, so you know, working with these you know endangered species, be it you know a little turtle that you know natively likes to lay their eggs in parking lots because they're super smart, or yeah. uh, or the Komodos or the Fiji Islands, is there just like a lot of record keeping that needs to happen, just like on on a daily basis about kind of everything there is um we have a software program called tracks um (laughs) and that is our record keeping software where we can put dang near everything in there um a lot of it is we we record pretty much differences um (laughs) if the animal eats less one day we'll record that or if the animal uh you know reproduces or or lays eggs we record that um we record animals weights uh on a, and and growth rates uh quite mm-hmm. frequently um and then uh yeah so so every every individual animal at Denver Zoo has uh we call an accession number and so they're okay. all individually identified and that's how we uh are able to record sp- you know, specific things for every individual animal. Um, and so it definitely is, it's a lot more record keeping than you would see in just, you know, a general hobbyist collection. Um, because, you know, one thing to think about is yes, I'm the section keeper for these animals. And so I look for these, look after these specific animals in my section, you know, right now, four days a week, cause I'm on four tens right now. Uh, but the other three days are the relief keepers job to look after the animals, in my section. Um, and so we have four relief keepers in the building, um, that they do not have sections. They're not section keepers. And so they rotate, they, they're still working four or five days a week, but they're rotating throughout the building, um, caring for the animals within the sections. And so when I leave for my weekend, um, I put up these relief notes, you know, talking about what's taking place throughout the week in my section, things to look out for, what they need to do. Um, but then they also refer to tracks to see, you know, has this animal eaten? What's its most frequent weight? Uh, this animal laid eggs. How many eggs did it lay? Um, all that because, you know, I need to be really good at communicating to these guys to help them. Uh, better care for the animals that are in my section, be up to speed with the animals that are in my section. So record keeping definitely is a huge part of my job as well to make sure everything runs smoothly. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was, as you know, as I've, as I've kind of progressed a little bit from outside of, I mean, it, it sounds bad cause it almost sounds like degrading a little bit. It's not by any means, but like outside of, you know, balls, boas and, and bearded dragons, you know, as you get into mm-hmm. A little bit more of those eclectic or rare 
or sometimes even endangered species that are available in the hobby, I'm finding that, you know, the record keeping, because there's so little known about that, mm-hmm. is becoming a, it's a very important part. And so little data that I'm finding that people are keeping, like on dart frogs that haven't been bred very well in captivity or even at all, they're recording barometric pressure outside, you know, they're logging temps and weights yeah. and all these things. And so it sounds like there's quite a bit of overlap between the private, you know, hobbyist community as well as you know aza professionals to just try to add to that ball of knowledge that i think we're starting to see more of an overlap Mm -hmm. oh definitely for sure i mean zoos wouldn't be where they're at today or you know reptile zookeepers wouldn't be where they're at today uh if it wasn't for the hobbyists um you know some of the sometimes the hobbyists have a little bit more freedom to be able to do you know, environmental studies or, or, you know, enclosure differences studies than we do. Um, and so, yeah, definitely sometimes we'll reach out to these hobbyists that are so, you know, so in tune or so specified with a certain species to figure out how to best care for them. Um, that definitely takes place. Um, but then, you know, yeah, just like you're saying, we might get in a species that no one in the state or no one even in the world has cared for before and we have to figure it out and then, you know, record all this and, and publish papers on, on our findings. Um, you know, prime example, I know you brought it up, but the Lake Titicaca frogs, um, yeah. you know, we were the first zoo since the seventies to keep them in a captive setting. Um, and we were the first zoo outside of Peru uh, or, or even first, first private entity or captive entity uh, to keep them in captivity or breed them outside of Peru where they're, where they're natively found. And so we, we acquired these animals. We acquired 20 individuals back in 2015 and we were, Oh man, it was, it was all, all staff on deck. You know, we were doing everything we could and everything we could think of to best care for these animals and, and figure out how to care for them and, and everything. Um, we were doing daily, if not twice a day, uh, water chem tests just oh, to make wow. sure their, their water chemistry was fine. Cause I mean, it was a huge deal, but you know, we had no idea what they were going to eat in a captive setting. We had no idea what even temperatures to keep them at in a captive setting. Um, their water parameters. I mean, we had to figure all of that stuff out, which was, an amazing experience, a stressful experience. We were fortunate enough not to lose any frogs, which was amazing. Um, And then two years later, we were able to reproduce them and produced like well over 500 frogs. Um, I I remember the day that they were all out. That was insane. Oh, it was so nuts. We had so many Lake Titicaca frogs because we expected, you know, that was the, the first time that they've been bred in captivity outside of Peru. Uh, so we had, we had really no idea what was going to happen. Um, you know, we had all these tadpoles, we had so many freaking tadpoles and we were feeding them and raising them up and we had like no die off, which was amazing, but it was insane. And so we had, I mean, if, if anybody listening is from Denver, you, you saw this, but we had the exhibit full of tadpoles. We had like 300 gallon stock tanks in back that were full of tadpoles. Uh, we had multiple of those full of tadpoles. And so they started getting to the point where they were morphing out into froglets and we were calling zoos, begging <laughs> them <laughs> to take Lake, Lake Titicaca frogs. Um, Cause that's, you know, that was the thing, right? Once you breed an animal, you had to have a place for it to go. And right. we just did not expect to have this many and to have no die off. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're calling zoos we're we're begging them we're like please and zoos you know everyone's pumped because it's a new species into aza facilities and so zoos are taking 10 aquariums are taking 15 and we're like no we need you to take like 100 (laughs) we need you to take 50 uh and so finally you know we sent we sent you know half a dozen to uh probably six or seven different facilities uh within the nation and then we finally had Chester Zoo reach out to us it's across the pond, you know, over in England. Uh, and they ended up, I think, taking 
150 or, or 300 uh, off our hands and they distribute them, you know, within Europe. Uh, and so we were able to get, you know, a captive population over into Europe, which was amazing. Um, and then finally, Omaha Zoo said, we'll take the rest because they had this huge uh, display that they had built for hellbenders that just didn't work out. And so Lake Titicaca frogs worked out for them. Um, That's, so then we I, ended up I'm keeping looking. some and, and raising some up. But so now if you ever go to any other zoo across the nation or over in Europe, uh, every Lake Titicaca frog that you see came out of Denver. Yeah, we, we went on a little trip because I was I always like to check out zoos to like, OK, how are they doing their habitats? How do they yeah. do it? Out? Like if they have multiple animals, if they do cohabiting species, how do they lay it out? Basking spots, hides, all these things like how do they do it? And yeah. I saw that exhibit and I was like, oh, I know where those came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. You know, I'll, I'll always remember that because it was such a crazy experience, but uh, it was a blast. Oh man. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask a little bit. So you, cause we, we, we kind of bounced, we, we, we've danced around it a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's always to me kind of felt like for a long time, there was this kind of separation of the hobbyist specifically with, you know, with like the herp to culture community and the AZA professionals. There's always been this kind of like degree of separation which I always yeah. thought was kind of odd because all the animals kind of came into the country the same way not mm -hmm. all of them legally mm -hmm. and that's how they're in both both of the hands of that privately and not mm -hmm. but I always felt like is there a separation is that is that kind of true and is that kind of waning oh it, it, it you're yeah you're definitely hitting the nail on the head it it is true um I would like to think that that line is starting to disappear Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, we're getting a lot of hobbyists that are uh, inspired to care for their animals better um, yeah. and care for their animals in a more scientific way, because uh, that initially was the was the separation um, is you had the the zookeepers or the the, you know, the, the I, I don't I don't want to say this, but I'm going to do it just the the herp, you know, herpetologist professionals that did mm -hmm. it as a career and 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 then you have the hobbyists and the the, the zookeepers or you know herpetologists care for their animals in a more scientific way um right. you know they're they're doing studies they're speaking specifically in scientific names uh they're they're caring for animals more scientifically uh and then you have the hobbyists which and, and i don't mean this in a bad way but it's just kind of the best way to explain it um the hobbyists care for their animals more in an anthropomorphic way. And if you're not familiar with that term, uh, anthropomorphism is giving uh, something human emotions, right? Um, and so if I, if I call a snake a dirt bag, or if I, if I say that snake hates me, that's an anthropomorphic statement because snakes do not have the, the behavior of hate, right? Um, right. That animal's not literally a dirt bag, um, you know, that's just my anthropomorphic belief. And the hobbyists would care for their animals more in an anthropomorphic way that annoys the scientists um, or bugs them because we're all about or they're all about the sciences. And, and mm -hmm. anthropomorphism is like a huge no-no in the scientific community. Because if I come out and, and do a scientific study uh, with an animal and publish that, that study – if there is like one statement that is slightly anthropomorphic, it will be completely discredited oh, man. right then and there um, because it's just a huge no, no. And I think that is what, you know, really separated them was this big anthropomorphic feeling or way to care for reptiles that just frustrated them. But we're starting to see, you know, like I mentioned, the hobbyists are starting to get, a lot more passionate on on advancing their their herpetological care uh which is definitely helping bridging that gap and and you know i i would like to to consider myself a liaison because i started as a hobbyist and and right. made you know progress to this and i still am a strong hobbyist i have close to 30 reptiles at home 
I am still very involved in the in the hobbyist community, you know, hence the reason why I'm doing this podcast. Um, I love the hobbyist. I love the hobby of of reptile keeping. Um, but my hope is that the reptile hobbyists would stop anthropomorphizing their animals. I mean, mm-hmm. you could still love your animal. You could say this, my snake loves me, you know, which is not true. He, he didn't but. break everyone's heart, but, um, <laughs> you know, you could still do that, but we, we need to understand that these are reptiles and we need to care for them and think about how we care for them in a less anthropomorphic way, because anthropomorphism is one of the biggest detriments to this hobby. You know, when I see someone, you know, in the middle of winter taking their iguana wrapped in a blanket to the grocery store, it breaks my heart because one, that blanket is literally doing nothing for that animal because that animal does not uh, generate its own body heat. Uh, But that person is putting that iguana's health at or life at risk just because of their emotions and they're anthropomorphizing that animal, thinking that animal loves them and wants to come with them to the grocery store, you know? And that is what drives me nuts is that, no, these animals live in very specific, you know, microclimates out in nature and they are designed to live in these specific microclimates that the second we take them out or remove them from that environment, we are putting them in a systematic stress because they are no longer at the proper temperature gradients that they require to be at. They're no longer at the proper humidity gradients. Um, And in my personal opinion, every time a reptile is handled, even if it's been habituated its whole life, it's going to be somewhat stressful because that is not a natural thing for that reptile. These are majority of them are, are prey items, you know? And so the second they're picked up by a giant predator, it's going to be somewhat stressful. Now, yes, they might have been habituated to it, but it's just a non-natural experience. And so I'm not telling you to leave your reptile in its enclosure and never play with it, never handle it its entire life. But we need to understand that these animals are not dogs. They're not yep. humans. You know, we need to treat them as such. So, sorry, big that's rant. <laughs> no, no, that's totally fine. And you, you're 100% correct. I feel that that's... And, you know, using that as a big way that, you know, entities out there are, you know, kind of targeting us to do away with us first before moving on to the fuzzy critters. Um, Oh, for sure. Which kind of makes me, uh, it makes me actually want to, want to ask you, what do you think about like MacGyver the Tegu? That. I'm not familiar with who that is. Oh, so there is a big red, uh, big red male Tegu. Oh, his own. The, he has his own social media presence. Yeah, I think I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, the big, he, big he obese grows, yeah. red tegu. Yeah, he's actually uh, every everything that I've seen him. He doesn't seem that obese, but okay, not 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 the best thing. Like they still feed him. I've never seen him be fed like human food. They still, uh-huh. I still, I still see him be given like a varied you know, well-balanced diet that I've seen. I don't know if it's 100% okay. true, but it's like sure. a free, they, they, they treat it like a cat, like a free yeah. roaming. They still give them like an area to bask and access to free water and yeah. things like that. But he's very anthropomorphized. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, treated like a person, like their kid, but it's, it definitely, it, it's a balance that I've noticed and anyone out there might correct me about that or not, but mm-hmm. Like, what do you think about animals like that that are kind of given free roam? They're still, you know, given the opportunities to seek out their thermoregulation needs. They're still given well-balanced diet. They're not given, they're not given Cheez-Its and chocolate. They're still getting what they need, but their, the handling and the anthropomorphization of it is taken almost to that extreme, which is, can make a lot of us kind of go, ooh, like, what what do you think about those type of situations? I mean, so my personal opinion, and I will I will back it up with science because that's how I believe you should ever you should you should do in, in any situation. Right. My personal opinion is I am very against free roaming reptiles. Okay. Um, 
yes, you can make it work. Obviously, people do it, right? Yeah. Um, but when you're caring for an animal in a supplementary way, and what I mean by that is, you know, this animal is kept in an environment that is bare of all natural uh, resources, but I supplement them to keep this animal alive, right? So this animal does not have the constant proper thermal gradient that it would be exposed to in the wild, but I offer a basking spot that way it can still warm up and thermoregulate, right? Yes. Yes. Um, This animal is not exposed to the proper humid gradients um, or humidity range that it should be exposed to in the wild, you know, like a constant 60 to 80% being for a red, red tegu, right? Mm-hmm. But I soak that animal on a frequent basis to maintain proper hydration when needed for shedding. The animal right. stays hydrated, it sheds properly, right? Uh, or this animal, you know, isn't eating a natural diet uh, that it would be exposed to in the wild, but I supplement it with these fortified diets that give it the specific vitamins and min- minerals and, and nutrients needed to keep that animal healthy, makes it work, right? Right. It's just, it's not the ideal way of caring for an animal. And again, in my opinion, um, right. yeah. if it was up to me, you know, I would design an exhibit for a red tegu that would specifically match its natural environment you know and and have and the enclosure would be large enough that it would exactly match the home range of that animal you know which might mean that that exhibit is the size of you know a football field uh that has the proper temperature gradient and proper properly maintained uh humidity levels because that's that's what we should be striving for right is is to keep these animals the most naturalistic way again my opinion because if we can that would be a hundred percent doing the best best for these animals you know would be to put them in a slice of nature now that's not a hundred percent realistic but we should be striving for that because one it is going to be the least systematically stressful situation for that animal um you know if i if i have you know, going back to hydration for this red tag or whatever it is, if I have a snake or the ball python um, and I keep it in a, a glass aquarium with paper towels, but I soak that animal, uh, you know, every time that it's going through a shed cycle and the shed comes off every time, I might think that, oh, this animal's perfectly fine because it's shedding fine, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But majority of its life, that animal is chronically dehydrated because it's kept in such a dry environment, but I hydrate it at the exact moment it needs to be hydrated to have proper shedding. But it being chronically dehydrated is going to cause so many issues. Um, uh, Robert Mendek actually came out with a paper specifically on varanids talking about what chronic dehydration does to reptiles. Uh, And when they have this this buildup of uric acid or these... uh, it can lead to gout, which, which gout is a huge problem uh, within within not only varanid lizards, but all lizards uh, mm-hmm. due to the potential constant stasis, status of being chronically dehydrated. And when we are free ranging our reptiles, we do not have the ability to keep them properly hydrated yep. um, because majority of your reptiles don't drink standing water at least tropical reptiles i'll say they don't drink standing water uh a lot of your reptiles are getting majority of the of their hydration from the humid air that they're respiring you know yep. they're breathing in that humid air and that's keeping it that's keeping that constant homeostasis of hydration but when we're having these fluctuations of a hydrated animal and a dehydrated animal it causes so much stress on their kidneys, on their system, that you are going to shorten that animal's life expectancy. Hands yeah. down, science is showing us that. So yeah. it is just, in my opinion, a selfish way to care for your reptiles just for your own personal gain. 
Um, right. And if you cannot design an exhibit that is large enough or suitable f- for a large species, and that's the reason why you're you're free ranging it. Again, my opinion, you should not have that animal. And that's why I don't have any large varanids. Because I know, I mean, even with Me neither. Desert, <laughs> yeah, with like a savanna monitor yeah. that everybody loves. Minimum yep. 10, 12 foot cage. Huge yeah. substrate yeah. to bury. Huge yeah. temperature gradient that nobody thinks about. Mm-hmm. They want to be fed rats. Yeah. Large insectivores. Yep. But, yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Which is, you that, know, even, yeah. yeah. It, it's a whole topic that we could go on down for. for oh hours. gosh. Yeah. I almost started it, but, but I, w- I will leave it at that. Uh, right. People can yeah. reach out to me if they have questions. Uh, and I will, I will talk about it all day. Cause, cause yeah. 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 So um, I'll try to wrap this up a little bit. I know okay. um, just, I mean, just the two of us going, sometimes it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a long time for someone to listen to yeah. just two people talking. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. So, I can talk about reptiles all day. So <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and I'm, I'm going, I'm going to take you up on that at some point. Yeah. Um, so before a little bit, um, we've, again, we've danced around it a little bit. So I, you've probably done a few studies. Um, and I think you, you had mentioned before that you had done a study on one of them. Yeah. Um, and, and saying that, you know, if you do any sort of anthropomorphic statement at all, it's instantly discredited. So, I mean, what are some of the ones that you've done and like kind of what have they kind of centered around a little bit? Sure. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you two, talk about two that I'm currently working on. Um, One study that I'm really excited about, I've been talking a little bit with Sam Parrott about, I don't know if you know Sam, Uh, he's in the the Facebook group for uh, advancing, oh gosh, advancing her reptile care or something like that. Mm -hmm. Forget it specifically what it is now, um, is, is, uh, lighting, you know, a big thing in the reptile community right now is lighting and, and the different levels, uh, or different, different infrared wavelengths and kind of what they do for reptiles. Um, but also visible lighting and, and the importance of visible lighting, um, which is something that is horribly overlooked, uh, in the reptile community, uh, which is kind of sad, but, but, what, we'll get into that another time. Um, and yeah. so right now, what I'm doing uh, is inv- a study on environmental enrichment through lighting, uh, lighting and heating, all right? Um, and so I have these orange-throated skinks, uh, and I have four, four sub-adults. And with two of them, I'm setting them up how we would set up any reptile, right? Uh, any lizard, any, any uh, uh, diurnal terrestrial lizard, okay? Um, so I have... Uh, a T5 light fixture over top of them providing their UV and I have a halogen basking light. All right. Um, Lights turn on at seven lights turn off at seven, you know, basking temperature of 110 degrees, thermal gradient of 90 to to 76 degrees, right? Pretty generic lizard setup. Okay. Um, The other ones, the other two, I am exposing them to a, difference or a gradient in both lighting and temperature over a 24 hour period. All right. So I am using a lighting system that is mimicking sunrise and sunset. Right. And the temperature, the color temperatures are changing over a 24 hour period. So, you know, if you look outside at the at sunrise, the, it's more of an orange light you know and that changes to a more white light throughout the day and then sunset turns back orange to an orange lighting um so i'm exposing them to that um i also am exposing them to a difference in temperatures over a 24-hour period so you know nighttime's nighttime it's cold whatever um but then temperature is slowly gonna rise uh you know getting you know, 76 to 80 to 85 to 90, 95, whatever. Um, and then getting up, you know, to that 100, 110 ideal basking range. Uh, but then getting above that, getting up to 120, 130, because out in the wild, you know, especially Colorado, very, very teaches us this, this very well. <laughs> temperatures are not the same and not constant every day. Right. It changes, 
which is going to change an animal's behavior in the wild and how they respond to those differences in temperatures. Uh, right. And so I'm exposing these animals to temperatures that are too hot to see what they do, right? Um, out in the wild, animals have already shown us when they're too hot, they're going to retreat to a cooler area of the exhibit, right? Um, and so that's one of my hypotheses is going to happen with these animals, which is, you know, probably... Uh, going to be going to be revealed but uh so yeah and then and then you know the temperatures are going to drop later in the day uh and then the lighting is going to fade into nighttime um so instead of you know sun's on sun's off we're going to see the sun mimic what it would be in nature and temperatures mimic what it would be in nature and now so i'm taking those two and i'm doing ethograms to assess behavior or behavioral differences on the two animals, all right? What behavioral differences are, am I seeing on these two animals that are environmentally enriched through a photo cycle, photo cycle and temperatures? And what behaviors are, am I, you know, observing through the animals that are set up in a setup that we would normally care for any lizard, right? Um, and my hypothesis is that we're going to see behavioral differences, uh, <laughs> not only in basking, thermoregulating, but, you know, potentially they're going to eat at different times. They're going to forage at different times. They're going to seek out water at different times. Um, and I'm going to then going to take that uh, and, you know, write a paper talking about, you know, the differences I saw, how these are positive differences, because my ultimate goal and everyone's goal in a captive setting should be encouraging activity. Um, right. activity levels of a captive reptile are dramatically decreased, uh, because, you know, the animal sits there and it's perfect basking spot. And we feed that an animal out of a food bowl or out of tongs. The animal doesn't have to hunt. It doesn't have to thermoregulate it has It doesn't have to hide from predators, which leads to obesity, uh, right. and, you know, a, a boring display, right? Uh, and so I'm going to take this paper and say, hey, we can environmentally enrich our animals just with something as simple as lighting to encourage healthy activity, encourage healthy thermoregulating, um, and encourage more natural behaviors. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the studies I'm working on. Um, hopefully going to be – it has not officially started yet. Um, I'm still getting all the supplies, but uh, – um, developing the ethogram, uh, but hopefully uh, middle of next year, end of next year, I'll have have a paper for everyone. Um, and then the awesome. other one that we're working on is uh, um, kind of metabolic rates and growth rates with Komodo dragons. Um, and I'll I'll just kind of quickly touch on this one because it's not it's it's still in development. Uh, or we're 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 doing the study right now, but it's still. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're just in the middle of it right now. Right. Um, but uh, it's amazing what we don't know about Komodo dragons. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone thinks that we know a ton about them because you see all these documentaries, you see all these books on them. Um, but they're they're quite difficult animals to study in the wild, uh, and not many people have done it or are doing it. Um, and so we don't know what the uh, average growth rate of Komodo dragons is in the wild. Um, and so in a captive setting, uh, unfortunately, Komodo dragons do not live as long uh, as we believe they do in the wild, which we don't 100% know how long they live in the wild, um, which is another thing. But uh, females specifically uh, die at a very young age due to reproductive complications. Um, they constantly cycle, are constantly developing and laying eggs, which just, you know, as any chameleon keeper uh, knows, yeah. <laughs> is, is, you know, cause for problems. Um, and so a lot of your female Komodo dragons die at a very young age, and nobody knows why. Uh, and one of our theories is that we are growing our Komodo dragons too fast. They are reaching uh sexual mature not even, I, won't, I won't say sexual maturity but reproductive capabilities too early mm -hmm. uh and males 
uh, adult males usually die from arthritis, uh, which we also believe is because of an accelerated growth rate. Uh, and so we're, we're doing this study where we are uh, tracking metabolism based on two different feeding regimes to see what the feeding regime, uh, which feeding regime is the best to monitor growth rate and monitor metabolic rate. Uh, and then we're also uh, slow growing our Komodo dragons, uh, where we are just restricting diet uh, to, uh, you know, decelerate the growth rate, which we know that all reptiles have the ability to adapt their metabolism based on food intake. So these Komodo dragons right. are not skinny. They're not unhealthy. Uh, I mean, as you've probably seen from all of my videos and photos, they're not... <laughs> you know, anorexic, lethargic Komodo dragons, they're still healthy, healthy weights. We just restrict their diet. And so they have adapted their metabolism to grow slower. Uh, right. And so obviously that's going to be a very long study because I have to wait till they're adults, which might take 12 years. Um, right. And then wait for them to hopefully live to a ripe old age of 50 and die from natural causes uh, right. to confirm or at least have a better understanding of what a natural growth rate or an ideal growth rate would be. Um, so yeah, pretty complicated. <laughs> Going to take a long time, but you know, we, we're, works, we're always striving to improve how we care for reptiles, which in my opinion, everyone should be always trying to improve, you know, strive to improve their reptile care. Uh, right. But yeah. So I like to think that we're making slow progress. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I, do I'm, too. I do too. I'm yeah. seeing a switch. Like mm -hmm. there's, there, there's still, there's still going to be the, the, you know, dramatic step down from, you know, professional AZA keeping, but there's still always the debate of aquariums and tubs. Yeah. regardless of how you set that up it's yeah yeah I mean, it's still a box but for sure um for sure yeah there's i'm I'm hoping that there's a bit of a a bit of a slow progress up taking little yeah. steps and i mean i i think there is you know because with with recent studies and advancements in technology and in studies and science you know it's just that alone is helping us better care for reptiles i mean think about think about where we were just 20 years ago with with heat rocks and no uvb right you yeah, know uvb wasn't around until like i think 84 85 yeah. So. yeah so yeah so cool well um i really want to thank you for you know giving me some time to do this and to talk to somebody who i mean not necessarily getting anybody who just breeds reptiles but you know for someone who is one path along this huge expansive world that we all love and they took the path of zookeeper so thank you yeah, so much for, for sure i talking a little bit about that today yeah no problem no problem at all maya uh, i'm gonna just throw this in my advice to anyone who is looking to get into the zookeeping field um yes. is one experience get as much experience as you can um per, and obviously reptile experience helps but even just animal care experience. Um, and then if you specifically want to get into an AZA facility, uh, internships are your best friend. Do as many internships as possible. Choose the line of zookeeping you want to get into or the taxi you want to get into. So if you want to work with reptiles, do reptile internships. Because yep. relevant experience helps a lot. Um, venomous experience is your golden ticket. If you have any way of getting venomous experience, that is almost an automatic in for reptile internships or jobs. Uh, and then a lot of people say, I mean, the, the reptile or the, the zoo community is a very tight knit community. I know zookeepers mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, a letter of recommendation coming from me to a zookeeper that I know at another zoo goes a long way. Right. Um, and so get out there and, and get to know zookeepers network as much as possible. Um, and a lot of people say it's about who, you know, in the zoo community, which it definitely is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also like to say it's, it's all about who knows you. Um, when you do these internships, make, you know, make, make a, make yourself known, 
Um, right. I am actually head for the head of the intern program at Denver Zoo. So I do the hiring and intern selecting. Um, and I've had countless interns. I can probably tell you the name of four of them because they made an impression. Right. And I will recommend them to another zoo. Right. So when you're in these interviews, take it or in these internships, take it as a working interview. Really make an impression, really make yourself known, because that is going to go a huge way in the zookeeping community. Um, and then obviously, go to school, get a degree, because you can't become a zookeeper without one. <laughs> Correct. Because so. working means something, but you still need to learn to. So. Yep, you do. You do. It's, it's very true. So um, if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, um, how, would the, how would be the best way to do that? Yeah. Um, the best way to reach out to me is on Instagram, um, zookeeper Troy, uh, feel free to, you know, follow me, message me. Uh, like I said, I could talk about reptiles all day. So if anybody mm -hmm. wants to reach out to me asking questions about lizards, Komodo dragons, reptiles in general, or how to become a zookeeper, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I, I love talking to people, love talking to people about reptiles. So no problem. Cool. Thank you so much, Troy. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. hopefully you guys enjoy this podcast um you know stay tuned for more if you have any suggestions about who i should try to get onto or questions you want to hear you know stay tuned to the regular youtube channel as well as regular updates from me so hope you guys are having a great day whenever you're listening to this and we will check you next time <laughs>